And who's got any kind of technical certification? Just something, A plus, whatever. Somebody taken some kind of cert? Been through those tests? Especially the prometric ones where after you get to a certain point, it figures out you can't possibly fail so you don't have to go any further? Those are cool tests for me. Because in IASIS, you go to Orlando, Florida, and you stay there for two weeks for the training. You walk in, there is a desktop PC sitting at your desk, and there are two five-inch, I can't hardly get my fingers that wide, five-inch three-ring binders, one for each week. Who's heard the phrase, learning by fire hose? <laughs> yeah, that's where the instructors are throwing stuff at you so fast you feel like you're standing in front of a fire hose. IASIS, I like to say, is learning by tsunami. Mm -hmm. It is 12 hours a day for two weeks. You don't even get the weekend off, okay? And literally, it's, it's 12 o'clock, it's time for lunch, there are sandwiches in the back, grab one, get back to your desk, eat now, taste it later. And they're off and running. You start on day one with, here's the on-off switch. On the last day of the second week, you are dissecting ones and zeros of the MFT table on a hard drive. And you're doing it without looking in the book. Does this mess with your head? Yeah. yeah. Halfway through the second week, I went to go get some money so I could buy some sodas. Could not remember the pin to my ATM card. The brain's gone at that point. Just <coughs> toast. So you get through the two weeks, you survive. You get 30 days off. Cool down period. Then you're assigned a coach who is a CFCE certified examiner. He hands you, back then, he handed you a small three and a half inch floppy and you had to do an investigation on it. They don't do that anymore because it's really hard to find three and a half inch floppies anymore. So they hand you a USB thumb drive, a little 512K. It's a joke. And you have to find evidence on that little thumb drive. And then you have to generate a report that will stand up in an international tribunal. The first one's the hardest. Okay, I'm lying. The first one is as hard as everything else that goes thereafter. You have to complete eight cases over the next nine months. And you have to do totally successful. The last one is a, literally a hard drive. Uh, right now I think they're shipping out 320 gig hard drives. You have to find tons of evidence. You have to find all kinds of things. Make this big report. And if you've never heard the term, you have to carve a file that's hidden on the hard drive, which means you literally have to use down deep editors and pull the data off by hand and rebuild the file over on your investigations computer, put it all back together and make it a file again. Why do you have to do this? It's the final. If you don't get that file off the drive, you don't get to take the final. The final is 100 essay questions. Once you get the final, you tell your coach, yes, I got it off the hard drive. And he goes, great, clock's ticking, you got 30 days. 100 essay questions. When I was a coach, I would always tell my students, keep writing. When you think you've answered the question, keep writing. Because the people who are grading it do not know you from Adam. You have to convince them that you know what you're talking about. Everybody that ever did that passed, no problem. <laughs> Once you take the, the final, you turn it in, it is graded by three different assessors who are veteran uh, examiners. And so long as at least two of them agree, congratulations, you are now a certified examiner. And for three years, you can kick back and relax. The fourth year, you have to take a refresher test, which is really silly and simple, don't worry about it, uh, to renew your, your certification and go forward. So that's how I found out. I actually did know what I was talking about because I did pass the test. And it literally is one of the hardest tests, one of the hardest tests I've ever taken in my life. So once I had that, I realized, hey, this is pretty cool. And I get on down the road. Got very fortunate, met my wife, we got married, she's in the Air Force. Guess what military people do? Travel. Travel. <clears throat> so I've been living happy as a freshwater clam in San Antonio. Drink coffee, smoke too. That's right. And all of a sudden she says, hey, guess what? We're moving to Washington, D.C. Excuse me? Okay, so we pack up and we go to Washington, D.C. So here I am, a hairless Texan, 
showing up in Washington, D.C. in the middle of November and there's this much snow on the ground, I am not having a good time. I didn't think I'd ever get warm again. I'm going to take a drink on that. So I get up there and get to working for the government. That's what you do when you're living in D.C. You work for the government. Everybody does. And yes, one of the first things I get is a security clearance. I had to laugh because when they send the investigator out to talk to people who've known you, you know, who are they going to go talk to? I'd been a cop down there for years at this point. Who are they going to go interview? Cops. Right? So they find my partner, the guy that I worked with side by side for a long time, and he meets him at the sheriff's office. They ask him a bunch of questions. Do you trust Jim? He goes, oh, hell no. <laughs> and so they go on with that stuff. And the guy says, hey, is there anybody else here that would know Jim that maybe I could talk to? And Henry looks at me and says, you're kidding, right? Open the door. If he's in a uniform, Jim knows him. Trust me. <clears throat> and the guy goes, okay. So I got my first security clearance pretty, pretty easily. Then I moved up. And yes, there are three known levels of security clearances. There is... No, it's secret and top secret, but the one below SCI. confidential. Uh, confidential. confidential. Thank you. It's confidential, secret, and top secret. And then there are lots of layers above top secret. And there's there's different flavors depending on who you work for and work with. So I get mine through the Department of Defense, right? But then they loan me to the FBI. Guess what they said? Oh, no, no. We don't trust DOD. You got to go get our security clearance. Seriously? I got to go through this again. And then, a year or so later, they loaned me to the Department of State. Oh, guess what happened again? New security clearance. New security clearance. So at one point in time, I actually had three or four. I've never actually heard whether three or four were active at the same time. But I had one with FBI, one with the Department of Defense, one with the Department of State, and one with another entity that I cannot mention in this room, or I will be in prison for the rest of my life. Right. Do you like the way I said that? I and by the way, I won't tell. when I was getting ready to go to help the FBI, the guys I'm working with said, hey, I'm going to go help the FBI. And they're like, cool. And then I go work for the FBI. Guess what the first thing they tell me is? You can't tell anybody that you work for the FBI. Huh? And they give you a little phrase. All you can say is, I work for a government agency. That's all you can say. Which, if you live in DC any length of time, and you talk to somebody, I say, hey, Todd, where are you? He goes, I work for a government agency. Oh, those guys. OK, cool. Yeah. We all know what it means. You know, it's kind of like when you ask somebody a question, it's like, I can neither confirm or deny. Oh, you did it. OK, got it. Sure. Yeah, I <laughs> that was the trait phrase that we used. Yeah. So fast forward some more. My wife comes to me and she says, we got to go to Germany. Seriously? Okay. By the way, there is way more snow in Germany than there is in Washington, D.C. <laughs> and if your driving is smart, and the smart's this tall, and the snow is this tall, don't drive a smart. Just saying. Learn the hard way. Not, not, not going to be a good mix, ever. Even on a good day. <laughs> so, I get to Germany. The company I'm working for in D.C. says, ah, we got lots of jobs in Germany. Just head up there. We'll get you something. Cool. I show up. And in the contracting world, you'll hear this. Yeah, we lost the contract. <laughs> they got no job for me in Germany. All right. Well, I had been working on, on a degree. And I thought, well, that's not a problem. You know, we're, it's a really good situation if you're living overseas. You can actually live there quite cheaply. So I figured, cool. She works. I'll work on finishing up my degree long distance. And everything is good. And I'm at the store, the, the commissary, for those who are in the military, I'm at the commissary, and I bump into a guy from the FBI that I had worked with in D.C., and he's like, oh my God, you're here? Nope. Yeah, I think so. So he goes and tells his friend, because there is a forensics lab in Stuttgart, Germany. Who knew? I didn't know. And next thing I know, I'm a government employee again, running the forensics lab in Stuttgart, Germany, which I did for several years. And then I uh, had a personal issue with my mom, who's quite old. And I came back to San Antonio, kind of took care of her for a while, went back to working for the government again. And when I did that, I realized I 
don't like working for the government anymore. That's just a personal thing. A lot of people like it, eh, I'm done. After you know, lots of years, yeah, I'm done. So uh, the company that, that Todd and I work for has actually been trying to hire me for over six years. I would get calls, hey, we'd like for you to come work for us, and either I was in Germany or something wasn't right, didn't happen. And they called one day and they said, okay, FedEx is coming tomorrow, there's gonna be a plane ticket, get on that plane, come to Chicago, we're gonna do the Godfather deal, we're gonna make you an offer you can't refuse because it's time for you to come work for us. And that's exactly what they did. Basically, I walked in, it wasn't an interview, it was like, so, what do you think, you wanna work here? No, nope, I don't like Chicago. Personal thing, that old hairless Texan, cold snow, <laughs> I like Texas. And I said, we have an office in Richardson. And it's Texas. That works. So, did the deal. That's where I'm working now. So, over the years, I will tell you about a couple of things that everybody seems to be interested in. A couple of these things happened while I was in Germany. Uh, a couple of the, the more spectacular ones, let's put it that way. And so you understand, when you start doing what I do for a living, I actually get to a point where I very rarely tell people what I do. They said, what do you do for a living? Computers. Shuts them right down. They don't want to talk anymore. They're like, oh, geez, yeah, I don't want to talk about computers. Cool. That's exactly what I want. Because if I make the fatal mistake of saying, oh, I'm a forensic examiner or a forensic investigator or something like that, I get one of two answers. By the way, it's two in Germany, two in the U.S. Mm -hmm. I get one of two answers back from them. It's either like, ooh, you deal with dead bodies. Well, I have done that, but that's not what I do every day. Or I get the whole thing, ooh, is it really like CSI? And I always say the same thing, it is, except real life. Because I don't get DNA in 60 seconds and I don't yeah. solve crimes during the commercial. That would happen. <laughs> <laughs> so, as I say, going along, doing stuff. Uh, one of the things I was very fortunate to do was I was able to attend a class from a gentleman named Scott Moulton. And he is the preeminent person that if you ever have a hard drive die, SSD drive, hard drive, whatever, if you ever have one die, if he can't get it back, nobody can. And, and I mean that seriously. No one knows more than he does about data recovery. And I got an opportunity to go through his class and get certified in data recovery. So I'm in Germany running the lab, and the Department of State comes and says, hey, we have this laptop. <laughs> they actually have this lump that's encased in mud. And they said, we have this laptop. And I'm like, really? That's what that is? Okay. They had a bad guy in Uganda throw it in a river as he was being chased. And they fished it out of the river. Bring it to me, and they said, hey, you're a data recovery guy. Get the stuff off his hard drive. Now, for any of you that don't know, hard drives are not hermetically sealed. Water can get inside very easily. So, three months it took for me to clean that hard drive, get donor parts, get another hard drive just like it, rebuild it, and get the data off. And I was very successful. I got about 90% off. And this bad guy in Uganda it was a particularly nasty character. He had before, during, and after shots of him executing about 700 people. Wow. So I get all that, package it up, I give it to the Department of State so they can give it to the Ugandan government because we're doing them a favor. And I'm done. I get on to the next case. It's one of the things you do. A couple of months later, I get a call and they say, a military aircraft is waiting for you at the Stuttgart airport. Pack for overnight. Go get on it. You want to give me a hint? Yeah, you got to go to Uganda and testify in this guy's trial. Oh, 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 oh. good news. Good news. You understand I don't speak Ugandan, right? Yeah. Don't worry about it. We got people down there. You're going to be covered. Okay. What I thought they meant by covered was not what they meant by covered. <laughs> so I land in Uganda, and there's an army Humvee, two big army guys that look like they just walked out of Afghanistan, bristling guns and body armor and stuff, and they walk up to me with this, this vest, and they go, here, that ought to fit. Put it on and don't take it off. Okay, so I put the body armor on, they grab me, throw me in the Humvee, and we start driving. We go out, we go out, and we get, I can see the field from a long ways off, and it's just people everywhere in this big tent, and I'm thinking, it looks like, you know, when, when I grew up here, you ever seen those big 
revivals where they put the big tent, everybody comes, preacher gets all fired 